Hi, everybody. I'm Matthew Kaufman here along with Jack ja Dodd. Jack, welcome to the show. We got a bunch of stuff to talk about this afternoon, starting with John Carlos Stanton, the big fella coming back for the New York Yankees. You know, having him back is such a big key to this team. And obviously, you know, you look at John Carlos Stanton, there he is, really looking to boost this energy for this Yankee team. Oh, 100%. I mean, this Yankees team has not been the team that we are accustomed to seeing uh, of them. You know, the beginning of the year, they were re really hot. Best team in baseball without, without any debate. But uh, as of lately, you know, they're four and ten, uh, four and six in the last 10 games. Obviously, that's a uh, below 500 record, not what they're looking for. They're looking to get back on pace, back on track. And I think... I mean, you can probably have your debate here and there over who you think, but I think behind Aaron Judge, John Carlos Stanton is about a doubt the second best player on this Yankees team. And when he comes back, that's just going to not only obviously help their batting and help their lineup and all that and help their scoring, but it's also just going to make their their team feel more um, momentum. And I'm sure they have better chemistry with Stanton and some of the other guys. You know, he traded for a bunch of guys, Ben Tendi, you know, he's great, but he's not – he hasn't been there like Stanton has for the last like two and a half years. So, I mean, um, Stanton comes back. I think the Yankees are going to figure out themselves a little bit. I'm not saying they're going to be like how they were at the beginning of the year, because honestly that might be a little unrealistic. They were pretty much perfect in the beginning of the year, but I think they'll become that, you know, around that one C type of team that we, we should be seeing from them as, you know, they are the one seed. So I think Stanton coming back is definitely going to help the Yankees and, and lead them to the right direction. Absolutely. And you look at, I mean, the Yankees and the A's. Last time these two teams played each other, obviously the big West Coast trip coming up, Yankees play the A's. And then starting Monday, they'll play the Angels in Los Angeles. So last time the Yankees played the A's, the Yankees were 53 and 20. As of today, the Yankees are now, or as of when they played the Mets, in their last series, they were 75 and 48. So a big difference there, obviously, for that. But we're going to take a second here and look at John Carlos Stanton's home run. So just what he has done against the A's, we're going to take a little look and listen here of John Carlos Stanton. Yeah, Matt, as you can see, he, he gets extra base hits almost more than he gets singles. It's insane. Yeah, and, you know, that's his home run from last time. Last year, I mean, that ball was absolutely hammered. And, you know, obviously that ball was hit so hard. I mean, that no, you, that's not a normal thing to hit it in the dead center field in Oakland. So, you know, for Stanton to be able to, one, hit the ball that hard, but also the fact that, you know, he's coming back in this series. He's trying to get the Yankees off to the push that they need. Obviously, winning three games in a row. Benintendi's come up with some big hits. Judge with the home runs, 47 and 48 against the Mets. You know, Judge, who was struggling really in a big slump at the time, now trying to find his groove again. And you can tell when the Yankees have Aaron Judge red hot, the rest of this team really is red hot because you have LeMahieu at the top of the order. Ben Benintendi, we talked about. Judge getting hot now. You got to get Rizzo. Torres with the misplay against the Mets the other day. Um, really, it's just Stanton comes back. This team definitely should have a boost of energy with him yeah. in the lineup. And the power game, so much bigger with him as well. Now, another thing – we talked about with this a uh this a l east team or division it's a closer division now than what it was a few weeks uh, before the all star break Seven and half games, right yeah, absolutely and you know we're going to look at the last time the yankees played the Met, uh played the a's they had matt carpenter in the lineup he reached base in 7 of his 10 starts that's during that stretch Obviously, Hicks hit the game tying home run the day before, or that on that Thursday against Houston. That was that big game against yep. the Astros. So they were kind of coming in to against the A's in New York. Now, obviously, having to go on the road, and 
besides the fact going on the road, not only do they go on the road just to play Oakland, but they have to play the A's as well, uh, the Angels as well. So, Mm -hmm. which is this West Coast trip is going to be a really big trip because the A's and the Angels, obviously, later West Coast, not New York time for the Yankees, where we have 7 o'clock here. But, you know, you look at what they have been able to do against the A's and the Angels lately. They've been able to hit off Otani. You know, that was in Yankee Stadium, that doubleheader game where Mm -hmm. Judge hit the two home runs. Yeah. So it's definitely been a little more of a success for the Yankees against a struggling team like the A's, who's started to pick things up a little bit. But obviously, the Yankees, these are two series that the Yankees really need to win, especially heading into Tropicana Field later next week against Tampa Bay. It, listen, I mean, so there's a lot that, that can be said about this Yankees team. Every year, obviously, they're the one of the most popular teams in all sports. People talk about them from beginning to end. Every team is going to have streaks, and some streaks are going to be better than others. So, you know, the Yankees have been a little bit cold for a little bit, but they've also been versing some very tough teams. They just had the series, the Subway Series with the Mets, of course. They had the rivalry with the Red Sox. You know, they've had some, they've had some tough opponents as of late. So, listen, the Angels, they have talent. Obviously, we know they have talent, but they're, they're, they're not – a playoff team they're not a great team the Yankees could definitely uh beat the A's um th- these are games that should really start the president for the rest of the season for this Yankees team so absolutely and also we found out the other day when the schedule was le- released for the Yankees one they're going to start the season off at home in Yankee Stadium which is always a big plus but mm-hmm. they also are going to face all 30 other team or all 29 other teams in 2023. So, you know, you usually you don't face all 30 teams. You haven't faced all 30 teams in the regular season. So now you kind of get to face all 30 teams or 29 other teams, I would say for the Yankees. So especially when you start in Yankee stadium, we saw him start in Yankee stadium this year against the Red Sox. They walked it off. Josh Donaldson with the hit up the middle, Connor Falefa obviously scored on that play. So, I feel like always starting at home, especially in Yankee Stadium with the fan base that the Yankees have, that's always such a big plus to start at home. And hopefully you start the season with the wins. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's a 50-50 chance we're going to play the first game at home or away. Um, starting it in Yankee Stadium, I mean, it's a good feeling. I don't think it's going to really affect the guys that much. It's, I mean, I, th- I think this is a great move by the NBA in terms of making every team play each other because, listen, there's over 100 games in the MLB. It's not like that in any of those sports where they're, where they're really playing this many games. I mean, obviously, like we were on basketball 82, hockey has a lot of games, there's other, but baseball, it's a lot. It's nonstop. It's every day. So I think if you're going to be playing that many games, you might as well just have every team play each other so every fan can see every player they want to see, you know, I mean, assuming no injuries, of course, or every, you know, this and that. So... I think it's a great move by the MLB in terms of the Yankees getting home field for the first game. It's nice. Maybe I'll be able to go. That'd be an awesome opening day, but uh, it's not like um, a big deal, I would say, for the Yankees. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, especially with, uh, you know, having the lockout this year and all that talk, but you get to face all 30 teams, which means a bunch of free agents. You'll see your free agent team from a year ago. You'll get to see, Obviously, the guys that you don't normally see, like the Yankees normally wouldn't play the Padres on an every-year basis. Next year, if Tatis comes back, you'll have Soto over there. So, you know, it's really a cool thing for them because – and the fans to see guys like you get to see Tatis in Yankee Stadium next year. You'll get to see Soto in Yankee Stadium. But it's not just that. You'll get to see other teams that you don't play every year like they are going to be next year. Yeah, Exactly. All right, so we're going to go from baseball over to the NFL and some big news in the NFC East. Tyron Smith down with the injury. He's going to miss up until at least December, they're saying. So that's big news there. Yeah, that that, that really uh, – I'm sorry to interrupt you, but that, that, that's, that's things for Dallas in a big way because their defense has been their most 
detrimental part to their team for the last few seasons. I mean, obviously, the, the, they've improved a little bit. Trayvon Diggs has shown some real promise, but move, losing a guy like Smith for that long is, is going to hurt them to start the year. Absolutely. And now, you know, the NFC East, which is at this point probably a very competitive division. You look at the Chiefs, the Chargers, the Raiders, you know, that division, the Broncos now with Russell Wilson over there. But you look at really this NFC East, the Giants looking to have a good year, you know, obviously Carson Wentz trying to have a good year with Washington, which we're going to talk about. So speaking of Carson Wentz, you know, he's been with two teams now, the Eagles and the Colts. He struggled with Philadelphia. He struggled. He got hurt in Philadelphia, obviously. Didn't bring his team to the Super Bowl. It was Nick Foles against the Patriots. And didn't do that well in Indianapolis. So now he has a chance again in the NFC East. He's going to face the same two teams, really, again, the Dallas Cowboys and the Giants, obviously. But now he's going to face the Eagles twice this year. So with Washington, you know, and Carson Wentz, how how big of an opportunity, really, for Carson Wentz is it at this point? Because you have to really change things this year. Or do you see him kind of going somewhere else if this year doesn't work out for Wentz? I'm glad you brought that up, Matt. And and listen, I'm an Eagles fan, but I am a big Wentz supporter. I believe in Wentz. I saw what he was able to do for that short period of time in our 2017-2018 season when we won the Super Bowl. That 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 first 13 game stretch, he was absolutely phenomenal. I still believe as an Eagles fan, we would not have won that Super Bowl if it wasn't for Carson Wentz, just because of the fact that he was able to give us that one seed, that home field advantage, and all of that. Obviously, Nick Foles did all the the actual you know hard work in the postseason, but Wentz I think was a big part of getting us there. But beside that, I, I believe in Wentz. I thought Wentz was pretty honestly pretty good last year. I think I understood why Philly got rid of him and moved on. I think there were some struggles there that, that would, and there were some issues, you know, between the front office that weren't able to be fixed and all that. I get that. And especially I, I see how Wentz, you know, he wasn't living up to his potential. But I think when you look at uh, Indi- Indianapolis, Indianapolis, sorry, uh, last year, Wentz was a decent quarter, quarterback. They were almost a lock to make the playoffs, you know. They fell off at the end of the year, they did, and they definitely should have beat that the Jaguars that last week of the season. But I think that Wentz, he's a big guy. He's got a great arm. He's got mobility. He has all the the necessary um, attributes to be a good quarterback in the league. And I think, you know, Terry McLaurin, um, he, he, he's going to be able to kind of, hopefully for him, I think he's going to be able to find his place a little bit and, you know, solidify himself into a quarterback in the league. Yeah, and, you know, you look at Washington for the 2022 season, they're going to start the year. I'm going to give you the first three games of the year, uh, first five games of the year, Jack. You know, Jacksonville at home in Washington on September 11th on Sunday. Detroit in Detroit, September 18th. Then you got Philadelphia, bang, right away week three. Already you got your division opponent. Week four, right back-to-back, Dallas Cowboys, as well on October 2nd. Then you got Tennessee at home. So it is definitely going to be a decent start, you hope, for Carson Wentz in that matter. But at the same time, you know, if you're Carson Wentz here, you really – you got to hope that this works out in a way for you because it's a very big opportunity for Carson Wentz right now. So you definitely hope things – work out I, for that. I, I would say this is really for Carson Wentz. This year is kind of, I wouldn't say make or break, but he, I would say if he, you know, he does good, you know, obviously he'll be fine. If he plays bad, he'll be one of those quarterbacks you see, you know, kind of get passed around for a long time. So I don't, I don't, I don't want to see that. Yeah, absolutely. So now Jack, you know, sticking with NFL category we're gonna go to the joint practice between the Miami Dolphins and the Philadelphia Eagles this one might hurt a little bit Jack to be honest Tyreek Hill you know burning Darius Slay and you said we mentioned earlier a hamstring issue potentially as you saw there so what does this mean for this Eagles defense you know Tyreek Hill joint practice they'll play each other this Saturday at seven o'clock but 
you see right there, he kind of trips in a way. So do you have any word on that for Tyreek Hill and Darius Slay on the Slay injury? Um, Yeah, I do. I have a lot of things to say about that. So if you watch that clip, you can see a couple things. One, Darius Slay did not get burned. He got tripped up a little bit. That He got an injury. He got hurt. He got tripped up. Two, that throw was – um, this isn't even a joke. I, I actually I like Tua. I think Tyreek's going to be great in Miami, but that throw was underthrown. People have had issues of Tua's throwing all year. That throw was underthrown, but I'm not going to go criticize him over that one throw. We still got the touchdown. It doesn't matter. Um, I actually believe the Ye- the Eagles and the Dolphins are not going to play to each other today. They were asked to actually just report that came out that the Dolphins have too many non-COVID-related illnesses, so they're not playing with the Eagles today. Um, the Eagles are still going to practice in Miami, but not with the Dolphins today. Um, and then, um, but in terms of that play, it doesn't mean much. Darius Slay seems to be fine. He was limping, favoring that play for the, that leg for a little bit. Um, didn't play on the 11-11s, but he, uh, the reports are saying he should be fine. So that I'm not really worried about that play. There was a lot of plays offensively that I saw from A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith, um, especially against Howard of the Dolphins, that the, the Eagles looked good. Um, but honestly, I would look at it as a benefit. If you're a Dolphins fan, you're an Eagles fan, Eagles fan, don't look at it in any negative or positive way. Just one clip, really. Tyreek Hill made a good play. Darius Slay like, tripped up. It was over underthrown. There's no, there's nothing really about that play that's going to change any outlook for anyone, I think. Absolutely. And, you know, obviously, I mean, training camp, joint practices, you, you get one play, you get burned. It's not a big deal. You got to shake it off, go to the next play. So here's a guy who's trying to figure things out. And Jack, it's Jimmy Garoppolo. I mean, he is with the 49ers. We call, we heard Kyle Shanahan say Trey Lance is going to be the starting quarterback. We've heard talks about maybe does he go to Cleveland with the Sean Watson being suspended, the Giants, a bunch of other talks, the Texans, you know, so where do you think right now would be the best fit, if not staying with the 49ers, where do you think the best fit for Jimmy Garoppolo is now that Trey Lance is officially going to be named starter quarterback week one? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so there was a lot um, of options that opened my mind about the Jimmy Garoppolo situation. So at first, I thought Seattle was the clear pick. I'm not going to lie. I didn't think Pete Carroll was going to be invested in Drew Locke and Jimmy Smith like he seems to be. Um P. Carroll said the other day that he believes that, you know, there's it's an old quote that if you have two quarterbacks, you don't have any. But P. Carroll believes that that he has two quarterback ones in uh, Geno Smith and Drew Locke, which I think is absurd. So, I mean, obviously he's going to say that to back of his guys. I don't know if he really believes that. But if he's saying something like that, he probably shows confidence in them. So, I don't see them trading for Jimmy Garoppolo. The The... Jets, I thought we're going to trade for Jimmy Garoppolo at one point um, when we saw Zach Wilson get hurt, but he should be back sooner than expected, so I don't think they're going to trade for him either. So I know this might not be the most interesting response that you were expecting, but I do actually see Jimmy Garoppolo staying with the 49ers. And now I know it be, be said that they're going to trade him, that they don't want him, but I think they're going to keep, keep with him. I think they're going to see how Trey Lance does. I don't think Trey Lance is going to – I think Trey Lance is going to stay the starter. I think he's going to be good, but I don't think he's going to shoot off like how a lot of people expect him to. And I think they're going to hold on to Jimmy Garoppolo in case he's not what they're expecting. So I think Jimmy Garoppolo is going to stay put for now. And, um, you know, you could say maybe the Seahawks as a as a contender, but I would say he stays in, Seattle, in San Francisco for now. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, obviously we heard what Kyle Shanahan had to say and immediately naming Garoppolo – really not the starting quarterback, putting Mm -hmm. Trey Lance on there. But at the same time, I mean, they haven't even – Garoppolo hasn't practiced with the 49ers really at all as a team. So does that kind of set up the fact that, all right, maybe we're done completely with Jimmy Garoppolo. It's time to move on. If we get a good trade target, something we're really looking for, maybe we give that a shout-out. But the fact that he hasn't practiced really is a key because – even if you said, all right, maybe he would be back QB too, he hasn't practiced with the team. So obviously it's the same head coach, but at the uh, same time, do you 
worry about, all right, if he is QB2, he's not practicing with us. What happens if something happens to Trey Lance or if the team's struggling that they want to go to Garoppolo, but he hasn't practiced with the 49ers? That's true, but, but players have held out before for much longer periods than this has been so far. So I would expect week one, Jimmy Garoppolo to suit up. If not, we, eventually he will. He'll start practicing and he'll play. It, he'll, I'm not saying he'll play as a starter, but he'll, he'll play. He'll, he's not going to sit out all year. He'll, he'll come back. And if he doesn't, then that's just going to make him even harder to trade. So at the end of the day, Jimmy Garoppolo is really not setting himself up for anything, and neither are the San Francisco 49ers. Yeah, and, you know, I mean – Injuries always are thing. Speaking of injuries, we're going to go to the second overall pick in 2022 in the NBA draft. Chet Holmgren, Jack, you know more a little bit about this than me. Explain mm-hmm. the injury with Holmgren and how this really affects the number two overall pick. Yeah, so I've been a uh, big supporter of Chet actually for a long time now. A lot of people knew him originally. He first was on post on Sports Center when he was a high school student because he crossed up Steph Curry at his own camp. So they put him all over Sports Center. He went viral and then ended up going to be the number one recruit, going to Gonzaga, and then the second pick in the NBA draft this year. So a lot of a lot of star potential already for this guy, you know, coming into the league. And I was excited to see what he was able to do in OKC, but. Him and LeBron were playing against each other in a pro AM game. Pro AM game. LeBron had a fast break. Chet uh, came into the defensive lane, tried to stop him, jumped up, landed kind of funny, hurt his uh, his leg, his ankle, and you know it was going to be out for the rest of the season. So that's a big burden for Chet more than I think it is for the Thunder because the Thunder still have all those picks. They want to lose. They're still tanking. They're still rebuilding. They're not expected to be anything. So that hurts for them. I mean, that doesn't really hurt for them. But it does hurt for Chet because, you know, you want to play your rookie season. You want to get that experience in. And he can't do that, obviously, if he's out. So I, I, it really stinks for the young kid. I'm sorry that happened. But he'll, he'll, I'm sure he'll come back stronger than ever. And, you know, speaking of, you know, that, but you have such a young kid. And, I mean, obviously, me and you haven't been in the NBA, NFL, or anything like that. But how – do you think the mindset of Holmgren is now, one, you're going to miss your rookie year. Two, you were the number two overall pick. You're hurt. So how do you think the confidence level goes either up coming into the following season for him, give him a little comeback opportunity there, or does it go down with the fact, oh, I'm injured my rookie year now? I mean, I think like the the natural mindset would be going down. You know, you're missing your – first year you don't know what you're going to be like when you come back you might come back even worse like much worse than you would have been and not even known because you never got to compare to anything you know what I mean so it's a sticky situation for Chet but if I were him I would keep my head high practice well you know the Thunder aren't going to abandon him he's still the second pick he's going to be fine as long as he puts the work in and has a successful recovery so if I were him just keep your head up believe everything will work out I, I think it'll be fine for everyone yeah, and, you know, other news around the NBA, Patrick Beverly getting traded to the Lakers. Mm-hmm. So that's a big thing right there. And, you know, Pat Beverly, obviously a big key for this team now. I mean, a team that, Pat, you know. Yeah, you continue. I'm sorry. That was, that was you continue. You know, a team that really struggled, I would say. Now Pat Beverly comes in, another veteran guy to help you out. And I feel like, you know, to me, veterans on your roster, in your lineup, no matter what sport it is, on the court, on the field, off the field, having that veteran there always is something that helps a team out. I mean, I wouldn't say for the Lakers' sake, um, his veteran presence is going to be needed the most. I think I think LeBron's and you know got that covered, but – Patrick Beverly has never missed the playoffs. People don't talk about that. He's never missed the playoffs. Patrick Beverly is a winner. He's a competitor. And as much as you hate him, it helps. When you, when you, the other teams hate Patrick Beverly, it helps. So I think, honestly, he was a good trade for the, Thunder, the Lakers. I don't think it's going to really be that big of a deal. But I think it was a good trade. I think it'll help them out, help them out a little bit. All right, well, that's going to be all for us today, everybody. Thank you again for joining us. I'm Matthew Kaufman along with Jack Dodd. 
We got more blast cast with Matthew Kaufman later on in the week. Once again, I'm Matthew Kaufman, Jack Dunn, signing off right here. We'll see you next time on Blastcast.